and thank you to the organisers for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I've actually got an illicit logo on my slide over here. When the Bragg Institute was set up at Anstow, they decided they'd have a nice logo made and then a subsequent administration decided that we're all one organisation, so it's all Anstow. So if this get, gets put on the web, that bit will disappear. Um, so Anstow, a bright future going forward with crystallography. In the Bragg Institute where I work, well over half of the staff uh, have at one time or another considered themselves to be crystallographers. Uh, they may be working in other areas of the uh, enterprise now, uh, but many have a training in crystallography. And as Florence has just highlighted, uh, an enormous amount of effort and planning goes into these major facilities. Uh, synchrotrons and neutron sources are not off-the-shelf items, and even the instruments that you, you uh, put adjacent to them are rarely uh, off-the-shelf standard items. So this is a concept drawing, and what I would point out to you is that this is where our reactor is. It's administratively separated from our scattering facility. Um, what they say inside the wall goes, and we just get the beam when they let it out. Um, so, let's see. Ooh, bing. All right, that one. Ah, okay. Um, I'd just point out that we're the Bragg Institute at Anstow, and the institute is named specifically to honour Lawrence Bragg uh, in consultation with his family. Um, so, a hundred years ago, Lawrence Bragg was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, and by that time he was back in, or in the UK for the first time, in fact. Uh, so, he was Australian born. Um, many of my colleagues refer to the Australian Braggs, and that's probably a stretch because Bragg the father was, of course, born on the Isle of Man. Um, Australia, at that time, was a very long way from anywhere, and you were looking at something like three months on a, on a ship to get back to Europe. Um, so, a hundred years on, we have a magnificent neutron source, uh, a reactor core that's about the size of a microwave oven, uh, 16 low enriched uranium fuel <coughs> elements, um, and this was switched on. The, the concept designs you saw there were about two years into the project and about six years later we had our first beam and of course this is a photograph taken using the Cherenkov radiation uh, actually generated by the uh, particles coming out of the fission process here. Uh, so our reactor actually has three major functions. Uh, production of neutron-rich isotopes, um, which are rather hard to produce in accelerators because it's rather hard to accelerate neutrons. Um, so, you know, neutron sources are required to, to make neutron-rich isotopes. And predominantly, these isotopes are made for medical applications. That use is not exclusive, uh, but certainly the dominant application. 70% uh, of the isotopes we produce are Technetium-99. Um, but many others for, for other medical applications. We also have a commercial operation irradiating very large silicon ingots. Um, and this was, a, I think, a key element in convincing the government that people had their eye on, on the commercial ball. Um, they put the biggest slots in our reactor to irradiate silicon. So if you have a device with an enormous silicon chip in it, it probably has spent time in our reactor if it's more than about five years old. Um, and the thing that we're most interested in, the provision of neutron beams for our neutron beam instruments. I'd also point out that ANSTO operates the Australian synchrotron, um, and we're hoping that's going to continue. Um, that's an interesting political question. And we have a suite of accelerators on site for a variety of purposes as well. So just to give you an idea, um, you'll recognise Australia from the world map. Sydney's around about here, and looking from where the new reactor sits, adjacent to the old reactor here, that's Sydney off in the distance. Um, this gap between the city and Anstow no longer exists. The city's come out to meet the facility. So the new reactor was built adjacent to the old reactor, which those of you who know the Harwell site in the UK will recognise as 
rather similar to Dido, and that's because it's an exact copy. Uh, the reactor ran, ran for almost 50 years, and the old reactor, um, and is now proceeding into a decommissioning phase. Um, we also have some rather attractive beaches nearby, and of course, wildlife. Um, I remember going to Ansto as a high school student in my final year at high school and being told, you know, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, you're going to have to live and work overseas because there won't be another nuclear reactor uh, in, in Sydney. Um, so don't believe things like that when people tell you them. Um, things change and can change really quite rapidly. Um, the, the people who were saying that wished it to be so because they thought it would affect their property values. Um, some, something I would say about the old reactor, it had very low intensity neutron beams and a very small range of uh, instruments associated with it. When the case was being made for the new reactor, uh, a couple of my colleagues went back and traced all the papers that had come from the instruments at ANSTO. And among them, there were papers that hadn't been cited in their first 20 years in existence. The good news about that is that the science had been insightful. People were doing good science to educate students with what was to hand. They were choosing to do good experiments that provided interesting data and new knowledge for which no application existed until plasma physics took off. And some of those papers now are citation classics with hundreds of citations from projects like the, the one at Catarash building the plasma reactor. So I would say to, to you here from developing countries with limited facilities, choose good projects, do good work, and don't worry too much about the applications. Sometimes you might have to tell the fairy story about uh, the occasional application. Um, but in reality, good science and education are what matters. So our initial suite of instruments at ANSTO, um, two of them weren't in the very first proposals, and that's Sicker and Pelican. The other seven, we've chosen to name our, our instruments after Australian animals, uh, because that way when you wake up in the, in the morning and you're doing an experiment on koala, you at least know which continent you're on. Um, the exception to the origin of the, the fauna here is Sika. Uh, that's a Chinese red deer, and the instrument has been built, uh, designed, built, and constructed by uh, a team from Taiwan, and it's now being operated by uh, a Taiwanese-based uh, and employed team at our facility. And this is a model we're looking to into the future for smaller countries who aren't going to be able to make maybe the half billion dollar investment required to build a reactor. Um, we've about built uh, about two thirds of what could be built in the existing guide hall, but in the planning phase, uh, it was all set up so that we can duplicate the guide hall on the other side of the reactor and over the 50 year projected lifetime of the reactor, uh, we should then be able to build another guide hall. So we started up with the, the usual suspects, uh, your high intensity powder and your uh, high resolution powder instruments, which at most neutron facilities are the workhorse instruments that produce large quantities of data. Um, the platypus spe spectrometer was a, a novel design and has been very successful, and most reflect reflectometers built at neutron facilities since the time of uh, that platypus first came on stream have copied their elliptical tank. We have a residual stress diffractometer. Um, it has the, the biggest sample table. It can move a ton. Um, so ironically, we've chosen a, a tiny little beast um, that's capable of, of killing a snake much bigger than it, uh, to name uh, the, the residual stress diffractometer. Um, so we started out with Single crystal diffraction, that's my instrument. It's uh, like Vivaldi at the ILL. Uh, Quokka is our first SANS instrument. And we have the two triple axis instruments, Taipan, uh, which is on a thermal guide, and Sika, which is on a cold guide. Pelican was a subsequent um, addition to the suite, and it's a neutron spectrometer 
which is now in commissioning. So the instruments in commissioning, uh, we got a large chunk of money during the global financial crisis um, as economic stimulus and we have been able to build uh, a backscattering spectrometer, a USANS instrument, a, an already very successful neutron imaging station and a second SANS instrument because SANS has been our very high demand uh, technique for the biological sector. We also have uh, hanging off the back of Koala um, a Lowy alignment camera uh, which is parasitic on the, the through beam from my instrument and also uh, lots of really good sample environment equipment. Um, so future in instruments and opportunities and this is um, not to, to make it look like we've, we've got everything and nobody can come and, and use these things. All of these uh, items are available through a proposal system. Uh, most of our scientists are very happy to hear from people who may not be able to travel to do an experiment. If you have a piece of science that you're interested in doing, write to one of the instrument scientists on the instrument uh, that you're interested in using. Um, if the proposal uh, fits with their interests, they'll probably take it on and be able to help you to achieve your uh, experiment even if you can't come. We do prefer that people come um, because we think it's really important that people see how the experiments are done and we do have opportunities for people to come for training uh, on an ad hoc but about once a year basis. Um, we are looking at relocating instruments from institutions which are closing down. Um, many of the neutron sources are being closed down uh, following the events of Fukushima. Um, in an unexpected way and there are some good instruments that uh, people are looking to relocate. Uh, I think I've already mentioned we um, can provide the opportunity for smaller countries to build an instrument and operate an instrument as part of our operation and proposals are always welcome. They're twice a year in March and September. Um, and the second guide hall is anticipated to include more internationally built and operated instruments. Um, and our future, most of our, well, about half of our proposals are coming in from overseas. So ANSTO is uh, a reasonably well-funded organisation. You can't do nuclear activities without being properly funded. You have to follow the regulations. And that's my timer telling me that I have two minutes and Jenny's just told me one. Um, so, um, one of the nice things is that we do have a, a publicity arm who are very helpful uh, in setting up things like Helen Maynard Casley's Crystallography 365 blog. Um, Helen did an enormous amount of work on that. Uh, it really was all her own idea um, and ANSTO provided some small support for it, but the, the, the hard yakka was really Helen. And also the Crystals in the City project, uh, which Helen and Niraj Sharma, who had been a postdoc with us um, for some years, came up with uh, putting various sculptures in various places uh, around the country uh, was highly successful. We already have a fairly strong outreach program um, where we go out into schools that has been established for a, a long time in Australia. Um, so we didn't actually increase that sort of activity, but we made sure that last year's focus was very much on crystallography. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and thank you again uh, for the invitation to speak.